taken by this feeling baby we're invincible Hi guys, and welcome back to another episode of Rebuilding Knotts County. The analysis days. As always, if you enjoy these videos, drop a like on them. That would be delicious. Let me know to keep doing them. So firstly, apologies if my voice sounds a little bit off today. Um, it's the day after New Year's Day, and I'm still feeling a little bit rough. But I've got to sort out a lot of stuff today because I've got to go Norway tomorrow. So... We're going to get into things. I'm going to do a squad report, something I completely forgot that I used to do uh, on the old analysis videos, where we just go through each player in the squad and just have a look quick gander at how things have progressed, particularly as now we can see it on this, which is kind of useful as well, before we get into the um, individual player stats and all that sort of jazz. Um, make the episode a little bit longer, but it just gives us a little bit more data so we can see who's doing well, who isn't, and whatnot. This will only cover the first team score because it's such a massive team. Anyway, so Matt O'Reilly, um, currently rated as the best player at the club, which is a strange one, considering that I thought he's probably had... An un, a bit of a subdued season, in all honesty. Four goals, four assists in the league, and 40 appearances. Four Man of the Match awards, though, so there's, he's definitely done some stuff. Like, I, I can't pretend that he's not been good in places for us, but I feel like he's had his worst season for us yet. Maybe I'll be wrong about that, but when we look at the history here... Uh, we'll try again. There we go. Actually, I'll tell you what. He was actually worse average rating last season, but he did get six goals and three assists last year. So, But it's that first season in the National League where he scored 16 times in the league. Um, which is so weird that our tactic hasn't really changed, but his scoring ability, I don't know, I think it's probably just because he was banging long shots, and I think they nerfed it slightly. So that's probably had something to do with that. Now, I don't know if it will be at the club next year, because of obviously the whole loan thing I'm going to be trying to do, and I think he would cost us too much money to bring in permanently. I, I don't know. I'll sort of decide on what I want to do with that in the summer. I might just bring him back on loan if I can get him. I don't know. Maybe I just won't sign any new players on loan. But I do want to try and sign D'Amico Dehaney permanently, I think, because I think he's one with a real, real future. But anyway, we can't dawdle around too much on this. Dara O'Shea. Um... I think it's unlikely... Well, actually, tell you what, though. His value of 100k and his contract expires in the summer. I wonder if we could get him permanently. That's really, really weird. I love Dara O'Shea, and I think he's been an excellent... Surely he, his contract is not up in the summer. Oh, it, it actually is. His contract is up. We might be able to sign Dara O'Shea permanently on a free transfer. That is very interesting. I might try this now, because sometimes you can make them an offer of basically nothing here, and they'll accept it, but we'll try this. They want £350,000 for a player whose contract is up in a month and has a value of a hundred grand. Are you out of your goddamn mind? Um, sometimes that works. Sometimes if a player's contract is up, you can offer the other club nothing and they will just say, yep, all right, fine, whatever. Um, that being said, I still think that... We'll cancel the offer for now. Uh, we'll put a pin in that because... Why is it going back to Matt O'Reilly? I think we're going to try and sign Dara O'Shea permanently because I really, really like this guy. Now, I know you can see that his potential is a little bit capped there. But if we could pick this guy up on a th on a free transfer, I would be ecstatic with that to add him to our back line because I think him and Tunji this year have done an excellent job. And Tunji Akinola, gone under the radar a little bit. Anyway, we must move on though. But that's good to see. Arthur Okonkwo, his contract is up in the summer. And unfortunately, because he's on £2,700 a week, I think he will be leaving. He says he wants to commit his future further to the club, but... Unless he was prepared to take an insanely large wage cut, that will just not be happening. Because Luke McGee is a better goalkeeper than him, uh, as you've seen this year. And I think just Okonkwo just didn't really fit what we were doing. I don't really know why in total, but he just wasn't the club for him. And he's on too much money, basically. Simple as that. Charlie Oliver. He's got one more year left on his contract. A decent value to him. I think he's a solid sort of understudy. He's only made 11 appearances this year, but he's scored some important goals for us. It's undeniable. He's made over 100 appearances for us since he joined and scored 11 times in the league, which is pretty damn good, really. Um, he's a solid player. Another year left on his deal, though, so he'll still be here next year without a problem, I would have thought. Moving on to Ian Saunders. So this is the one player that we've had big bids from other clubs from. Um, weirdly, Preston bid 350 grand for the guy. Got good crossing, dribbling, finishing, pass, not his finishing, actually his finishing is poor, as is his composure. He is very, very pacey though, even more so than Ron Coates, but he doesn't have the dribbling ability of Coatesy. He's just pure pace. Um, I feel like Coates and Saunders though, could be the ones to run the line for us on that right-hand side next year, because when you look, Saunders has got five goals and two assists in only 16 appearances in League Two, uh, League One last season. And I think maybe, if he hadn't got that injury, he could have maybe nailed down that role that Ron Coates has taken. So there's a lot to like about Ian Saunders. He's got another year left on his deal. I don't know if he's got a, an extension fee. He doesn't. Um, so we'll try to get him on another new deal in the summer. Try and put him up to like 2025 with an extension or something. Really nail this guy down. Because I think there's going to be big clubs interested in the summer. That That's very likely. Uh, Rico Souza, he's on loan at MK Dons this year. Has barely played for them and, and will be leaving in the summer. He was just a good player to have when we needed him at that point. Stephen Walker, of course... 
uh, the lad coming from Scotland. I think next year, him and Brandon Fleming, I want to see which one of these two is performing the best. And we've got to make a decision because I think that left-hand side still needs a lot of work. Uh, undeniable. He's got an assist. Nothing amazing so far. We'll have to see how he goes with that. Um, Matt Wolf is on trial, so we can ignore that for now. Uh, in fact, can I... One second, I'm just going to remove the players that are on trial because that's pointless. I'll do it afterwards, in fact. Tun Jackinola. I think he's been excellent this year. Four goals, one assist. He's played 44... He's played in all but two games uh, in the league for us this season and has had an excellent year. Four goals, one assist, a player of the match. Nine yellows, fine, but... I've been pretty pleased with that. He's tall. He's got excellent pace and acceleration. All the right areas for a defense, for a center back, basically. And, you know, he's got one more year left on his contract. I'll try to extend him in the summer as well. I think he peaked really nicely around sort of November and he had a little trough, but he's coming back up towards the end of the year. So solid for him. Milan Bars, um, he actually has another year left on his contract after this, but he's really not featured much for us this season at all, unfortunately, uh, which is a shame. He had a huge promise when he first joined us, but injury after injury just really has stymied him somewhat. Uh, NGO Baldwine, Again, he's got one more year left on his contract after this, and he will be with us next year, of course. But I just think the chances of him getting much game time is very, very unlikely, uh, given that he'll be competing against Saunders and Coates. And I would probably prefer to play either of those two over him just because they've got that potential to go forward. So it's been he's been a legend, but not quite. Uh, Regan Booty, of course, the man, the myth, the legend. His contract expires on the 20, um, 2024 but once it ticks over into the new season he'll be on a brand new deal which will start and see go through to 2025 so he's still got another three years left on his deal which is very very nice his contract i think will go up to 2800 pound a week now he has absolutely dropped off a cliff since now look at this that's actually quite insane uh, and the reason why is actually i don't really know why he has completely fallen off a cliff since christmas really and i think that comes down to me not rotating the squad and resting him enough now you know you'll get like a, a thing as you can see jd didn't can do with a little rest i had this problem last season this year i've kind of just ignored it because what would happen last year is i'd rest him for one game the very next game, it would say the exact same thing again. And then after a while, when you talk to them, it would just say, I'm not prepared to go over this again, even though you're clearly trying to do a positive factor and it would hurt them around. So I think next year, that's something we're definitely going to look at because I believe it's his sheer... And if this is genuinely the case, then that is an awesome feature because that's genuinely very realistic how you would get tired out of the season and just get burned out um, a la Leeds United over the last couple of years, potentially. So it's interesting that that's actually a factor. So... He did just start to peak up towards the end of the year ago, but that is quite some way to fall off a cliff. And probably the reason we struggled a little bit more towards the end of the season in places, and he certainly did. Five goals, he scored all within the first couple of months of the season. 13 assists in there too. Still a phenomenal season, but it probably could have been even better. But that does make me think though, if you look at one point, he was up to five, four and a half stars in this team. I think next year, with the right management of Regan Booty, because I think, I mean, this is his natural fitness is pretty solid actually. So... That might be why he's able to do it for so long. I think with the right management, we could probably get him back up to that sort of five-star level, maybe get him performing like a boss in the championship and get the best out of him. But this is going to really give me something to look at here. And this is what I mean about, again, why you should do these little analysis things, because you see things like this. You can see exactly when he dropped off was right around that Christmas period, and he just hasn't been able to recover since then because I just kept playing him. So listen to listen to your coaches on that one. Richard Brindley. He's got one more year left on his contract. Um, he's just I mean, a decent backup, really, for that right-hand side spot. Played a bit when um, Duhaney wasn't available, essentially. Had a little good run towards the end of the year and played all right, I must say. Uh, Robbie Burton. Yep, that actually strikes me as particularly clear. Um, we all know when Robbie Burton finally sparked into form. He had a pretty average start to the year. Uh, he's got two years left on his deal. I'm really pleased with him as a signing still, though. He's developing nicely. Well for the most part. Anyway, he's got good attributes in the roles we want. He's got a few little unhappiness things, so we'll have to be careful there. Four goals, one assist. He's mostly played off the bench, but has started a few games. A few man of the match awards too, though. I think there's a lot to like about Robbie Burton, and I think it was around about here, as you can see, when that was when he started scoring goals for us. He really sprung into life in the second half of the season and carried us through some matches. He single-handedly won us a few of them, so very nice indeed. Tyrese Campbell, a very up-and-down player. Uh, the issue with him is quite simply that he... I mean, he's on a lot of money, as you can see, but he also, his contract expires next summer, and he's basically on the maximum wages we're allowed to offer at the moment, I think. Or, or no, maybe not. I think since we've been promoted, it might have gone up to nearly £9,000 a week. So my question, I think I'm going to have to try and extend this deal. Um, if we can get a two-year extension on what we've already got, and maybe offer him max wages again then that might be enough to keep him unless I can find someone better because I really think he's done excellent this year. 26 goals in the league, three assists. He scored, you know, five of his seven penalties, seven man of the match awards. 
really, really good performance from him. He started off a bit slow and finally broke into life and again got a bit tired around Christmas, but then came back with a bang in January, dropped off a little bit, and then finished the season in pretty solid style. So he's a bit inconsistent, but I'm, I'm pleased with him in the grand scheme of things. Nathan Clark again. He's a centre back we've got on loan from, uh, sorry, on trial from Motherwell. I'm looking at, and I'm potentially going to go after him. I'm a bit concerned about his marking and his height, but he's only 17 years old, so yeah, potential there. Ron Coates. So something I've been trying to do is get a few of these guys on um, some trials too, because they don't always let you. Mm, I'd say 60, 70 percent of the time they'll reject the trial offers, but if they're a small enough club, sometimes they will let you have the player on trial. And since I'm taking very few of these players on like this, it's just a way to save my scouts some time. So Ron Coates. I mean, look at his progress. It is insane. This has been the year of Coatsy, um, to be honest. Absolutely undeniable. 16 dribbling at the age of 18 years old. Great acceleration and pace. Not as fast as Ian Saunders as it happens. The only thing that lets him down really is his crossing, to be honest. He's got solid, good composure, decent enough finishing. I know we were trying to retrain him as a striker, but he's played so damn well as a winger that I kind of just want to keep him there. Because... He's actually got seven assists so far this year because he's great at just passing the ball into good areas. Whether he's he's not really crossing, but he's just picking out passes. And long may it continue, I suppose. He's been sensational this year. He's just been on a complete upward trajectory here for the entire season, basically. All the way from around about May, he's just been continually going well. And that has been a really... He's probably been one of the standout breakthrough prospects this year. Ron Coates, or Ronnie Coates, as he's otherwise known. And that is superb. Really, really pleased with him. I want to see how he actually stacks up stats-wise. Uh, Mehmet Chuic, there's not really a lot to say. He's only made seven appearances all off the bench. Um, but I think he's got something for the future for us, potentially. He's had a pretty stagnated season, but that's fine because maybe a loan spell next year. There's definitely going to be options for the lad. Do not worry about that. Max Carverwell, he's just a young goalkeeper who I think will be leaving us in the summer. Yes, he will. Carl Deasy, again, another one of these guys I've got on a trial uh, from Dundalk. They probably want quite a lot of money for this guy, so it's unlikely that I'm going to um, be able to sign him. Plus, there's a few little issues with him. He's very, very short. Uh, is not the best on composure, but there's a balanced personality. Some of these ones are interesting. I I'd be tempted. We'll see. Um, obviously, we've got Niall McPhee. This is a strange one for me um, because it's actually s seeming to consider that... Oh, that's to be fair. That's mostly towards the back end of last season, isn't it? I don't know, actually, he started the season fairly well and then just kind of tailed off a little bit. But it would be fair to say that he didn't exactly tail off in the way that I expected, where he just fell off completely. He sort of just stagnated a little bit. Um, starting to feel like he deserves a new contract. Well, that's not true at all. Plus, he's got two years left here. I think with Niall McPhee, it's going to be, I don't know, we really need to sort out this left-hand side because something's not quite right there with the play, with the roles we're using because McPhee only got three goals and three assists in the league this year. A really, really poor season. 40 appearances and only a 6.64 average rating. That's really un, just not good at all. So... And he's clearly got the ability to play in those kind of roles. And he's clearly improving as we go along. But I think the squad just isn't getting the most out of him. And I think maybe an inside forward there might actually be a better option. And I don't know how well that would work with Niall McPhee because of his, yeah, very weak right foot. So, hmm, might have to take a little look at that over the summer period. Demika Dehaney. Uh, oh, hello. Is his contract expiring in the summer too? It bloody well is. Um, hmm. Okay, so... Two massive things I want to do. Wants to commit his future to the club. Is that our club? I assume that must be our club. He's made over 100 appearances for us. I think if we can sign Dara O'Shea and Demika Dehaney on free transfers this summer, that would be absolutely, per just absolutely perfect. Um, because it would save us a load on transfer funds straight out the bat. And we'd get two players that we have got known quality uh, in both of them. dehaney has been pretty good again this year. One goal and five assists. Not quite the amount of assists in recent years but 15 yellow cards though he's certainly given us a bit on that one but so many pros about this guy i'd be happy to bring him in permanently uh for a few seasons just to sort of see how things go now he isn't quite a lot of money at huddersfield so we might have to sort of negotiate around that a little bit i don't know but if it, if need be we'll give him a, a big chunk of money or because he's dropping down we can maybe convince him to take a little bit less it can work with the right clauses you can definitely make that work he's been okay this year you know Start, again, around November, December sort of time is where a lot of people kind of dropped off. And I think that, again, comes down to fitness levels and me not paying attention to that. Brandon Fleming. Oh, what do we say about Brandon Fleming? It's He started off so well. And I think he got those three assists very, very early on. But you can see that it just kind of... It was here. He really sort of peaked. And again, just sort of dwindled off for the rest of the season after that. And didn't really perform much in the latter half of the year. And that's basically just our left side, essentially. Uh, Ricky Griffiths. Not really a lot to say about the guy. Made some appearances. That's fine. He's one for the future anyway. We're retraining him here. Um, so it's really... That's going to be his main role for us. He, uh, he can play on the wing because he has got solid pace. But it's 
the the passing i feel like he's probably better slightly deeper i mean maybe we could play him on the wing but crossing i mean tell you what right he's not a bad winger either it's just and he's got some little extra bits about him like his great passing mm, i wonder and good flair too excellent natural fitness pace stamina acceleration too very mi like dimin diminutive I actually wonder if creating him as a winger might be the better option of these two things, to be honest. Um, in fact, I'm going to actually set that up now because, yeah, he's... Oh, wait, what? Okay, I, I, that's two or three times now I've taken control of his training and my assistant has just gone, nah. So we'll put it back to that specifically. But that's so annoying. I keep changing him to being this and they keep changing him back again, um, which is weird. I think it might be because they keep moving him down into the under-23 squad and they keep taking control of it there, perhaps. I don't know, I'm just going to have a swig of my relentless here. Orna Hegema only started two games for us this year, and he did score uh, one goal from open play, but, like, let's face it, this was not going to be a year for the guy. Um, <laughs> he, he was mainly here to back up Tyrese Campbell, who basically didn't get an injury all season, so pleasing there. Sam Hughes. Now, he's still pissed at me because I won't play him in the specific role, but every time he complains about it, I just go, all right, fine, I will, and then I just don't, and then he just never actually ends up doing anything. So that's fine. He's a very good... Um, defensive midfielder that's just where I want to be playing him I think he's perfect for what we want to do there and he's just sort of shown a steady increase over the year and that's exactly what I want nice consistent as you can see here that makes a lot of sense we, we should be seeing this sort of graph from players with this nice green bullseye and ones with the red one should be the jaggedy ones I would have thought so I want to see if that actually plays out Dion Kelly Evans very very little to say about him at all uh, he'll be leaving in the summer that's what we can say about him uh Lee Lee hmm inconsistent as you can see and I wonder if, right, the way to get more out of Lee Lee would be as an inside forward. Because that seems to be... I, I, the thing is, though, he's got dreadful finishing and his composure's okay, but it's great acceleration, agility, pace, passing, crossing is excellent too, hilariously. Um, I do wonder if maybe trying Lee Lee as an inside forward on that right-hand side, maybe making a custom role so when we play him, he can play as an inside forward on that right instead and just see whether that gets the best out of him because I think there's something there. Like, there's a lot of ability there, but we just need to get the best out of him. Because this year, we've just not seen anything out of him. No goals, no assists, no anything, really. Probably one of our worst performing players. So, I need to look at that, and I will be giving him a new contract. Unless we can... No, we can't. Okay. So, yeah, that's Lee. Damien McCrory, I think he'll be leaving this summer because he's just not good enough anymore. And he's behind a lot of people in that role. And he's also 32, so we're trying to sort of limit those kind of players around the club. Luke McGee. Really pleased with him. Um, conceded only 26 goals in 41 appearances this year. 21 clean sheets. Very, very good goalkeeper for us. Super happy. I know his average rating's toilet, but that's FM for you, isn't it? So uh, Kevin O'Hara, he, again, is another guy looking at right-hand side on loan from uh, on trial from Dundee United, potentially. See what he's like. Might be able to bring him in as well. Hmm, finishing. Again, it's just looking at these young players that we can get relatively cheap to try and bolster the squad, particularly because he's already two and a half stars. But, um, I don't know. Again, these are just trial players. We'll just have to see. So there's Matt O'Reilly, and we're back round the clock again. So we're going to go look at the league stats now. This is going to be quite a long one, I sense. I might have to try and uh, streamline these a little bit. <clears throat> so, average possession, we were sixth. Um, that's fine. I think we've changed our game style slightly as we've gone up the league. Penalties taken, we've scored, scored nine of them still. Sorry, scored seven of them. I'll be interested to see how many goals from set pieces we got this year. <clears throat> I sense it's going to be a lot still, but probably not as many as last year. Headers one, we're always down to the balls at the bottom because it just doesn't matter to us. As long as we're up towards the top on headers one ratio. Wow, that's a really seemingly low percentage, although I guess it's the entire team, isn't it? So, yellow cards, middle of the road. That's fine. <clears throat> we're not normally... We're a bit higher than I would have thought we were, actually. Red card. Oh, my God. Bon got nine red cards this year. We got none. That's a really good sign. Our disciplinary record's been excellent this year. Bolton's, however, I, they've had, I think, more than one game where they've had players sent off... Uh, more than one player sent off. I think they've probably had one player that's got more than two red cards, but we'll see. Uh, form is irrelevant right now. <laughs> see, look at this. We only scored 68 times this year. We were not the free-scoring team we've been in recent years. And I think that's just come down to, unfortunately, the fact that you can't score one-on-ones. We created enough of the bastards. I, I dread to see how many chances we've actually created this year compared to other teams, but we're unable to score them, unfortunately. And I'm sorry, it's not about composure. Or it could be, but it's to a, an insane level where you could have a striker with 20 composure now and they would still miss 9 out of 10 of them, it would seem. It's just crazy. I want to make like a super cut of every single chance we've had this year that's a one-on-one -on -one and see how many we've actually scored. Because I bet you it is... I would imagine that it's at least a 20-to-1 ratio. 
I would say. It certainly feels like it anyway. Cross completion. Middle of the road at 17%. Sunder uh, sorry, south end very, very high actually, which is surprising. Cross is completed though, nearly up at the most with Portsmouth up there on their 420 blaze it. Goals from corners, 10. So we've got 17 goals from dead ball situations already so far, but not the most in the league, interestingly. Goals from direct free kicks. Uh, we added one there, so that takes us to 18. We scored over 30 last time, so we'll see. Indirect free kicks. What's happened here? Why have we only got four? <laughs> we were absolutely dominating teams with indirect free kicks in recent years. And it's just fallen off this year. I wonder if that's because Regan Booty hasn't been able to put the quality in that he's done in recent seasons. That's 22 goals uh, in total from set pieces this year. And that's it, I think, isn't it? So, yeah, interesting, actually, that it's as low as that. But still, that's probably around about still 33-odd percent of the goals we've created this year. 22 out of 68 is, I think, a little bit less have come from set pieces, but that could have just been from that period where I turned them off. It seemed like there was, like, a, a struggle for them to come back on again, essentially. Pass completion ratio, 79% up towards the top. Right, passes completed were usually about mid-table, but it's this one I want to see. So, second most chances in the league. Portsmouth and us really really close and then a huge gap of like 23 back to Sunderland and then an even huger gap back to fourth place Doncaster so how Portsmouth didn't get higher up the league I don't know maybe they'll win the playoffs though but I don't know I just it's crazy the amount of yeah they also hit the target 45% of the time and we were a bit worse for wear on that one surprisingly um still hit the shots on target a decent amount but our conversion rate of eight percent is pretty poor and that's the issue for us unfortunately fouls against Somehow didn't win the most fouls. That's surprising, actually. But dribbles per game. 19 dribbles per game. That's fine, because we're a very dribbly team, and long may that continue. Um, that being said, best defence in the division by an absolute country mile. So, yes, we might have scored less goals this year. But from a defensive standpoint, we have tightened up beyond belief to only concede 27 goals in 46 matches. 13 better than anybody else in the entire league. That's the reason we were promoted. We were promoted on the strength of our defence, uh, which is saying something. We only conceded one goal from a corner. In the entire season. Bolton conceded 20. Bloody hell. That that says a lot to me. <clears throat> about our ability to concede or not concede uh, from set pieces. One goal from a direct free kick. And only five, which is pretty good for us, from indirect free kicks. So, yeah. I mean, what's that? Seven? Not bad. 25 clean sheets, most in the league. We don't make that many fouls either. We win... Not that many tackles, because we mostly have the ball a lot. Um, tackles one ratio could do with being a little bit higher, but still pretty solid. We've only conceded two penalties this season. I don't know if we actually conceded any goals from them. Presumably we did. But even so, that's still a reasonable amount. That's like a third of our goals conceded were also from set pieces this year. Even more so, in fact. Average attendance, one of the highest, which is pretty impressive, really, for a club that have been climbing up the league. 16,000 on average in League One. I'm pleased with that. I think we... What's our attendance capacity? It must be over 20,000. Well over. Hopefully we'll start getting... In fact, yeah, you can see it here. So that's probably about, I don't know, 20 odd thousand, 22 maybe for the capacity. Attendance by capacity, 80%. Lincoln City selling out every week, basically, it would seem. Uh, well, 12 of them, um, which is pretty impressive, actually, for 12 stadium sellouts. We had, an, we had one. We had one sellout, which was nice. Highest attendance, of course, Sunderland with 44,000. And Haas was 19,800. So pretty damn good overall. So let's have a look at the player stats now while we're, while we're on here. Uh, games won. Tyrese Campbell, 29. Um, okay, interesting. Anik lost 29 games as well. Yellow cards. Demico Dehaney got the most yellow cards. That is a lot. 15 yellow cards he got. And that's why he had that three-match ban. Red cards. Gone. Uh, wow, amazingly, no. Bolton, Bolton only had one player that got sent off twice. But they also had... Oh, no, Regan Riley also got sent off twice. As did all these other people getting booked as well. So, yeah, a lot. Ashley Hunter... I think he got almost all of those Man of the Match awards in the first half of the year for Fleetwood and then just didn't do anything for the second half of the season. In fact, he didn't even really play. Look at that, an average rating of 6.91 and he got the most Man of the Match awards. Crazy. Uh, distance covered. We're more interested in this one, aren't we? Noah McPhee, he doesn't half love to run. That's what I'd say. And Regan Booty gets about a bit too. Christ. Um, average rating overall. Stanislas dominates that one in the end. Regan Booty comes third. Uh, Tyrese Campbell, though, coming sixth is nice. And Duhaney, they're in 11th. So he's done a lot this year to be proud of. Look at this, he's just all Tyrese Campbell. 26 goals, 7 more than any other player in the league. Average minutes per goal by an absolute country mile. Shots overall, 168 shots. And, oh my god, I feel like he should have more goals, to be honest. But, hey, it doesn't matter. He's got it. 93 shots on target. Like, that's, that's 24 more shots on target than anyone else in the entire league. I wonder if his ratio to shots on target to goals is the same as all these other players. Who knows? Shots on target. Ron Coach, 62% on target, too. For a guy, yeah, he's so lethal from that right-hand side. I do wonder if, if he would actually be a 
a sort of competent striker. But I just worry that his height might be an issue for the style of football we like to play sometimes. But it, it does make you wonder, though. He can really hit the target, and he's got that dribbling ability. Conversion ratio. Ian Saunders at 17%. Tyrese Campbell at 15 So oh, maybe an option of Coatsy up front, Saunders on the right uh, later down the line. Maybe train him over the summer. But I don't really want to like impinge on his progress, considering how good he's been this season. So a tough one for us. Penalties. Tyrese Campbell uh, scored five out of seven. Aaron Lewis got six out of six for Lincoln. Fair enough. Regan Booty, though, still got the most assists in the league. I want to have a look at his, briefly, just see how many assists he's got in total now. <laughs> he's got 50 assists for, for Notts County in the league already. In three seasons, he's got 50 assists. Sure, it's his worst season statistically for us in this entire period, but 18 goals and 50 assists in three years in league football is still insane. So fair play, Regan, on that one. Key passes, not the most. Um... It makes sense why Dylan Magooch, or whatever, how that name is, Magoch, I can't remember, uh, is doing well because he got the most there. Regan Booty also very high. Matt O'Reilly solid as well. Chances created overall, though, Regan Booty still 38. This is the reason, and this is him in the early stages of the year. I really do think that if I'd rested him properly and rotated him around, we could have got more out of him this year and just nursed him through a little bit more. I'm going to pay way more attention to players getting jaded next season and actually try to take it into account. Even if it means resting them, and I'm not entirely sure I should do, it might pay more dividends in the long run genuinely uh pass completion obviously is mcgee because he just loves to knock it about at the back cross completion that's not that important for us because it shows the wrong stats it's always showing players that don't put crosses in very often dribbles per game ron coates not the most amazingly eric richards and Tariq Fosso. hello eric richards you're a region my friend are you on loan from someone you're not oh hello sir crossing dribbling first touch uh decent determination aggression flair pace eric richards you say Hmm, he is a very interesting prospect. A 19-year-old worth £125,000 playing for Scarlet with good crossing and dribbling. We'll just, uh, just, just, uh, just scout him, maybe, shall we? Scout him, get scout report on him. I'll add him to my regen shortlist. Um, we'll keep an eye on that. That could be an interesting one. The fact that he's as good a dribbler as Ron Coates and he's on the left-hand side could be very, very useful indeed. Um, that, that's, that's, hmm, have to take a look at that. Wow, Ron Coates has also been very good defensively, apparently. Although, that's more... I think minutes is kind of more important there. Tackles per game, nobody on there at all. Mistakes into a goal, nobody on there at all, which is what I want to see. Mistakes at all, nobody there too. Key tackles, uh, Akinola's made a decent amount, which is fine. Key headers, probably in Akinola again, yeah. Akinola and O'Shea, solid stuff. Uh, Dara O'Shea, really good on interceptions, though, it would seem, massively. Headers 1 ratio, Sam Hughes at 81, O'Shea at 80. Hopefully, Akinola's like, I don't know. 879 or something. Shots blocked, probably no one. I mean, he's only conceded 26 goals this year. Clean sheets. Amazingly, I mean, he, he's going to win, though, because he did it in five less matches. Luke Daniels was really solid for Bristol City. Uh, Bristol Rovers, rather. Saves held. Obviously, he's going to be right towards the bottom because he didn't need to. Penalty saved. Uh, did he even save any? Oh, he did, actually. He saved one of two. I can't remember who that was against, but he obviously did, in fact, do that. So... That is that, really. Um, let's go and actually do the little squad analysis bit now. Okay, so we'll start with centre-backs because, again, Luke McGee's played literally every game in goal and I'm completely content with him. Uh, I'll obviously keep looking at other goalkeepers because we've got our youngster in as well with keyballs, so it's not too bad. I want to kind of promote him through the system. So, centre-backs, it's been mostly Akinola and O'Shea this year. Akinola's played 52 games for us, but Charlie Oliver has also started 14, so there's a reason enough to give him a go here. And nobody else really... I think Sam Hughes might have played a couple of games at centre-back, uh, if need be, but still, not that important there. What we're really looking at with this is the... Well, team conceded. Um, you can see that, weirdly... We conceded very few goals with Charlie Oliver in the team, but it might have been against weaker opponents in the cup. I'm not entirely sure, but there's definitely a larger amount of goals conceded when Dara O'Shea is playing. Like, that is an undeniable fact there. Does make more interceptions, though, and he does win more tackles uh, in terms of his rating to them, too. So, hmm, interesting. His pass completion is slightly worse than Charlie Oliver, who does make more passes per game and more key passes and more headers and... Wins a decent amount of headers as well. He's not as good at dribbling, and he does he does like to cross the ball a little bit more. Creates more chances per game, but he hasn't got any assists. Uh, we score more goals with Charlie Oliver in the team as well. He scores more goals when he's in the team as well. And we win more points with Charlie Oliver in the team. This is a really strange... I mean, that is quite a noticeable increase in the way we play when Charlie Oliver has played for us. So he's made, what, 14 appearances, eight, four substitute appearances. To be fair, the issue there is that seven of those were in the FA Cup and the Leasing.com trophy. 
And that's why I have to take that with a bit of a pinch of salt, because only seven of those appearances, uh, sorry, seven of those starts were actually in the league. He did still score twice, so that's definitely worth noting and has played well in that period. But I think the stats might be buffed slightly by the fact that in the FA Cup, he played four times and got an average of a 7.72 rating, which is still nice to see. And it shows he can do a job, but I don't think it's enough for me to be like, no, we need to drop one of the other two right now. But my concern a little bit is that, that maybe Dara O'Shea isn't as good as we think he is. I, I really don't know. We... There's a definite drop in terms of the number of goals that we... <clears throat> the points per game is better with Akinola. We concede less goals and we score around about the same. Hmm. I mean, Akinola clearly is the way to go forward. But I still think if we can get Dara O'Shea permanently on a free transfer, I'll probably make that jump. But I do want to be looking at some youngsters. Potentially that Nathan Clark guy from Motherwell to come in and give us a secondary option there. So we'd have two sets of centre-backs that we can sort of rotate around. And that will allow us to not get that jaded issue. Particularly we find that in the midfield roles. Uh, in the centre mids we find that issue. Because I've not really any options other than Booty, O'Reilly and Burton. I kind of want two of every player in there. But there is a couple of guys I'm looking at again who might be able to fulfil those roles. So for centre-backs, I'm going to try to get... Darrow Shea permanently, provided the deal's right. And I want to try and sign probably that Nathan Clark guy from Motherwell to give us another option in there. And maybe, you know, some younger regens that perhaps won't be able to make the team straight away, but have got the long-term potential there to try and keep things going. I really do like how much of a nice young British team we're actually building. Something I really don't normally do on these saves because of the Brexit situation, we've kind of been forced into it. And it's actually kind of fun to just, I wonder if we can build a Premier League team that can maybe win the league with all British players. I think that'd be bloody fantastic just to try and see if I can do it. Um... Might not do it in the end. Or, I don't know. Anyway, that's what I'm kind of thinking for that kind of situation here. So, yeah, fairly straightforward on that one, I'd have to say. I'm essentially just adding to my notes as we go along. Uh, that way I can... Because I've got to go and record Transfer Window episode and do it straight after this. So, hopefully, I should get everything fresh in my head. So, fullbacks. This is important. Stephen Walker... We'll look at what he's done and compare him to Brandon Fleming a little bit, but we've still got to be careful because, again, he's only had four starts and seven substitute appearances, whereas Fleming's played over 50 matches for us this year. Dehaney's obviously the standout in that. But that being said, Brandon Fleming has got four Man of the Match awards, crazily. So we'll have a look at this one. So defensively, who is the best? Brindley and actually Fleming is a solid defender. This is one of the things we've always found with him, I think, if I recall. Uh, we're definitely worse defensively with Dehaney in the team and also particularly Stephen Walker. There's definitely a drop there and he does make less interceptions too. And that might be because he's actually even worse in the air than Brandon Fleming. Um, but you can see Fleming is definitely worse on this side of things. Tackles one ratio, though Stephen Walker's fairly solid. Pass completion, worse than Walker. Dehaney, again, better than Brindley. Passes completed per 90 minutes. Walker's a little bit more, but the, the where it really does tell though is, is the key passes. It's it's half, literally half of Brandon Fleming's key pass output. Um, he's just not quite there yet at the moment, it would seem. So, but still, we've got to look at other factors as well. Obviously, he's way worse in the air. Duhaney's decent in the air, so Fleming's, you know, not great in the air, but Walker's even worse. Um, winning way less headers. He doesn't dribble as much. His cross completion is vastly worse than Brandon Fleming's. Domingo Duhaney at 16% is solid. Brindley. 24% is very, very good, but 14 appearances, actually 11 in the league is actually not that bad. Brindley's got a really good crossing ability, and I think that's why I want to make sure that he sticks around for one more year with us while we try and find some kind of reserve in that kind of role. Um, it, it kind of pans out with that too. Stephen Walker does have a decent assist record, it's fair to say, but he's only got one in that. Um, Dehaney was seven so far this year. It's around about that same kind of quality. Fleming's down a little bit there, but Brindley really, despite completing a lot of crosses, he does not actually get that many assists. So they're not really leading to anything. And again, chance creation is great with Brindley, but for some reason, it makes me think that Brindley's creating one-on-one -on -one opportunities and they're just not putting them away. Uh, Walker's not creating a lot of actual chances, but we do score a decent amount of goals with Walker in the team. Hasn't scored himself, of course. Uh, points per game, again, Walker and Brindley, very, very high. Brent, Fleming and Dehaney, pretty low. Ah, I don't know. So I want to try and sign Dehaney permanently because I really do like him and he's been here for a while. It's just a safe option if we can bring him in on a free transfer. Like, it's totally safe stuff for now. He's youngish, decent signing for us. If we get him for free, the board will love the finances. Brandon Fleming obviously will be here next year no matter what, and so will Stephen Walker. If we find another amazing left-back talent, then I will try to maybe bring him in. Someone with a bit more height, because I know that's what I wanted last year, but I just couldn't find anybody, then I will maybe consider it. But I also think maybe it's because we are... I think this whole situation could be potentially resolved by changing the left-winger's role, because with playing wide wingers on both sides with wing-backs, the issue seems to be fine on the right-hand side. We, we know that's fine because of the way that we've seen the performances out of Coetzee and obviously uh, Brindley and Duhaney. 
I think the issue is that McPhee seems to be getting in the way of either Fleming or in sometimes Walker. And the issue there, or whoever's playing in that role. And I think if we can turn that into an inside forward role, it will hopefully get the best out of that winging spot because they won't be getting in anyone's way and have their own sort of role potentially to get more goals and cut inside of it. But it will also free up loads of space for a bombing on left-sided wing back. And I think that might be able to get the better out of Fleming and Walker. My issue, I think, with them is that they're not getting to the byline enough. For an attacking wing back, that's their ideal. That's their crossing situation is get to byline, cross ball in. But because the wingers occupying that role, they're not taking any of the defenders out of the way for them. And I do think that perhaps that's our best bet to try something out in the summer is to try and go for an inside forward or an inverted winger or even something crazy out on that left-hand side and see if that balances the team out a little bit better because I think that's the final piece of the puzzle to get the best out of this team is to sort out the left wing role. And I think that should slot in other stuff around it. So even if it means I have to switch Booty and O'Reilly's roles over, so Booty plays on the right-hand side of the midfield, um, just to give us a bit more cover on that left-hand opportunity if we're going to have players bombing forward. I don't know. We'll have to look at that when we come to it. So Duhaney tried to sign him permanently. I want to try and find another right-back, though, because I don't think Brindley has got long-term potential to be a right-back. Plus, he's 28. So we definitely need to sign another player that can rotate around with Demika Duhaney next year if he's here. And Walker and Fleming, happy with for now, I think we might be able to get them better out of them just by tactical changes rather than trying to buy our way out of the problem. So that's kind of my theory there. And obviously we've got youngsters coming through and I want to keep trying to find some, but I've got to, we've got this money and I want to try and spend it like laser targeted in the right areas of the team that actually need a first choice improvement now. And I don't think this is actually that. As for defensive midfield, literally Sam Hughes has played here almost every game. Booty's maybe played a couple of times here, but I'm just basically looking at this just so we can have a look at what Sam Hughes has done, essentially. So, solid. Less than a... I mean, that is actually really good. Team conceded per 90 minutes with him on the... On the that's nearly, nearly a goal every other game with him in. And that's really solid. 1.96 points per game is pretty much primo. Like, when you're looking at two points a game, that's basically title running form, or at least promotion form in most leagues. So... Solid. 95% tackles one ratio. His passing is excellent. He can play a key pass for days as well. Solid in the air. Doesn't dribble much, but that's fine. He can't cross for shit, but who cares? Um, gets a, an occasional assist. But I'm just super happy with the way Sam Hughes has slowly been developing for us. Um, and I want to try and give him a new contract. My issue is he might complain because of the whole... Um, favor position problem and if that's the case we may well have to cash in which would be a real shame or we might just have to bite the bullet start playing him at defense as a center back and then have to try and find another defensive midfielder if we want to keep sam hughes because i really do want to keep him he's it'd be a great ball playing defender as we could try to maybe try a bit more fancy football moving our way up the league a little bit and maybe having a ball playing defender could work as we start to try and expand our style a little bit i don't know that's just kind of all i can really get out of that for now Okay, so centre midfielder. This is literally the players that have played those roles. 48 appearances for O'Reilly, 50 for Booty, and also 46, uh, sorry, 45 of them for Robbie Burton, mostly off the bench. Which means we need back, we absolutely need signings in the centre of midfield. I kind of want at least five players capable of slotting into that central midfield role. And we just don't have that right now. And I think that's been the main problem. I think if we have, if we had two more players in that role that were competent, say two and a half stars with decent potential, that I was looking at, and I could have just brought them in for Regan Booty when we needed him. I think we could have ran away with this league way, way more, and Booty could have been player of the season. I think he just tied out towards the end, and I think my main target for next year is going to be to bring him back up to the potential level that I know he's surely capable of, because he showed us midway through this year that he's got it, and I still think he can reach that level again, provided we nurse him in the right way. But anyway, um, why is distance cover per 90 minutes, Regan Booty, at zero? That doesn't seem right to me. Um... I'm not entirely sure what that's about. Is it because he's not in the tick? What is that about? Why is it saying zero distance cover per 90 minutes? Okay, really weird there. Okay. And also... What? Uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. It must be a graphical glitch or something? Strange. Um. So, oh, is it because I've got him selected? I don't know. So, team conceded per 90 minutes. We can see more goals with Brigham Booty in the team. Like, Burton and O'Reilly actually do kind of get things nice and cushy, but it's hard to know what combinations they were actually being played with. Tackles one, though. Booty loves a tackle uh, because he can play left back as well, despite not actually winning that many of them overall. He certainly does a decent job. Weirdly, his pass completion is actually quite a lot lower than anyone else's, so that's surprising. But the key passes is just phenomenal. 2.8 key passes per game. Per game. What Much better in the air. Wins more headers. He dribbles less than anyone else, but he can cross for days. The assists situation and nearly one chance per game 
nearly one per game is crazy. Um, we score... Well, the, the key stat here is this one. Matt O'Reilly, interestingly, 2.17 points per game with him and the team. Burton slap on two and Regan Booty at 1.96 actually is the, the worst. But again, I do think that's because he's had some poor performances when he started to get more jaded. And I think without those, he's probably right in there as well. We've got a trio of excellent players here that can definitely do a job next year. But I'd quite like to add one or two more to the mix to be able to trade around four or five of them, mix things up, get the partnerships going still but just have that little bit more rotation ability so we can have a no issues with players getting jaded and whatnot. So we can get through the heavy Christmas fixtures that we're no doubt going to get next year, particularly as we're going to be going further in the cup. But at least we don't have to worry about the stupid trophy no one cares about. So we're going to have less fixture congestion because of that alone. But I mean, we're still going to have League Cup, FA Cup, all that sort of jazz. And we're going to be going further than ever before, probably because we're a higher status club. Um... And we're also going to enter the FA Cup at the third round this time. So actually, we're going to have a bit... This could be a really solid year for us because we'll have a little bit less fixture congestion, if anything. Being a top League One side is really difficult because you go quite far in the Cup sometimes. Plus, you've got the lower League Cup and you have to enter the FA Cup earlier as well. So yeah, definitely as far as centre midfield goes, I want two more solid young players that can come in and really do a job for us. And I've got my eye on one of them already. Um, so hopefully we can make that one a permanent signing and whatnot. And we've still got to... We might not be able to bring Matt O'Reilly back. Because I don't know if Fulham will probably want a lot of money for a permanent transfer. And if I'm going to impose this rule on myself about no um, loan signings, then I don't know if Matt O'Reilly will be back next year. So we might actually have to do a lot of work in revamping our central midfield to find Regan Booty, the ideal partner. Even if it is a case of we just put Robbie Burton in and have a load of younger understudies and give Burton the time that he potentially needs. I don't know. That's kind of my theory on it. So, Wiggers. I've excluded Milan Bars from this because he's only started one match and I wanted to kind of have a little bit more data than that. Like, he had some sub appearances, but... I didn't think the data would be kind of fair on him. So the key thing about the winger situation is, look, we've got four players, all 18 years old, who have five-star potential in this team. We have got a really stacked set of wingers at this club. And not to mention the fact that Reese Stewart, who's been on loan at Eastley this year, is also going to be coming back. And he's a left-sided player who I think can play inside forward. So Niall McPhee might have some competition on his hand next year. It's fair to say. So there's definitely... The one area where we are flushed with talent is our wing roles. If we could just get them right, there's going to be some real domination there. So let's just see who's actually done well. So from a defensive standpoint, Ian Saunders, really solid with him in the defensive side of things. And Niall McPhee, he does like to track back. And as you guys have pointed out before, and as I've pointed out, he's a really solid defensive player. Uh, he gets back and covers his fullback really, really nicely. So him playing in front of Brandon Fleming does do us a good service for that side of things, if nothing else. Ron Coates, however, is very much not on the side of getting back and covering uh, because he and Duhaney really do like to roam around a little bit. And I think that's possibly why we can see more goals with him and the team. It's quite a large jump between him and Saunders. It's quite literally nearly double. So and Saunders actually has the best average rating of them all. Maybe without those injuries, we'd have seen a lot more from him because he was starting to smash some goals in for us uh, at the early stages of the year. So it's going to be interesting to see how that one goes. They've all got decent determination, except for Lee, um, who's down on an eight. But also McPhee, in a 16 determination and a resolute personality now, I think based on the mentoring and whatnot, he's definitely got all the attributes to make a fantastic career of it if we can get the best out of him. And I think, you know, professional for Saunders, loyal for Ron Coates, and you've seen their progressions this year. It's insane. So, interceptions. I'd expect Lee Lee really solid there. McPhee not too bad either. And again, Ron Coates just really isn't getting in that kind of style. He's very much a case of a player you leave up the pitch and he will do stuff for you, but do not expect him to do much tracking back. Uh, tackles one. Ron Coates at 72%. Again, Baldwin 87. Dropkick McPhee, 80, sorry, 87%. Really, really good. But Ian Saunders isn't that much better than Coatesy on this one. Dropkick McPhee. No, McPhee really is an excellent player from a defensive standpoint. He, he'll keep us nice and solid, but he needs to have more attacking output. And look at this as well. Nearly 2.5 tackles per game. And Coatsy actually outdoes Saunders on this side. So, hmm, I'm seeing a lot of things I like about no McPhee in this one. All of their passing is over a reasonable length as well. Coatsy, pretty solid. Saunders down on that one too. McPhee, again, the best. Key passes per 90 minutes. This is a fun one to try out. Um, Baldwin, obviously the most. Ron Coates up there with Saunders. McPhee, not far behind. Lee, just straggling at this one. He's not going to win any of these categories anytime soon, it would seem. Headers one, though. He is the best in the air. Coatsy and McPhee are both very, very poor in the air. Presumably down to their height, I would say. Um, but where he really comes into his own is 6.4 dribbles per game. McPhee only at 2.46. Um, in fact, if anything, he's only got, he's got 10 dribbling. And yet, 16. Saunders is what? 8. Ian Saunders competes 5 dribbles per game. Twice as many as Niall McPhee. And yet, he's got worse dribbling stats. I think, again, this comes down to the fact that McPhee is being asked to play in a role that perhaps doesn't suit the system. And he's getting put into blind alleys sometimes. 
because that is a that's a left wing problem. Our right wingers are dribbling way way more. I, I do wonder if that's because we've got supporting side wingers on the left and attacking on the right, and maybe it could be as simple, honestly, as I normally like to have, if I've got an attacking winger on one side, I'll have a support on the other side, and the fullbacks will be the alternate so that they kind of interact like that. But it might be time to go for a more symmetrical system and have attacking wingers on both sides and supporting fullbacks on both sides. It might allow us to get the best out of the wingers on the left and the best out of the fullbacks on the left by actually allowing them to do a little bit more work in the areas that they're more comfortable with. That could be a, a more simple change to the tactic that could provide more fruit than we were actually expecting so that might be my first change because it's such a simple thing to do normally i like to have it that kind of asymmetric style so we might come back to that and try the inside forward thing out as well but maybe just allowing these guys to push themselves dribble a little bit more get to the byline a little bit more might get more balls in like the likes of coatsy because assists wise i mean saunders got three mcphee's got five so that's eight in total and coats and baldwin between them have got oh no sorry no so it's 10 between coach and saunders with 10 there um baldwin if you like as well yeah, I mean, they've got 14 assists on the right and five on the left. So it's very heavily right-sided. And I think that might be because the fullbacks can cross from deeper. They're not getting caught out as much as a result of it, but the wingers are getting into better areas. So are they scoring more or less? We'll have to have a look at that one in total as well. Um, but yeah, obviously the complete number of minutes is slightly more as well. Or is it 3,600 there? Yeah, it's definitely more minutes overall. So we've got to take that into account too. But then Lee's also played, you know, a decent amount of minutes on that side too so it's really hard to say at this point but there's definitely more stuff coming from the right than there is from the left uh cross completion ball at 21 percent lee lee 17 is solid saunas at 16 15 and ron coates at 13 you know for a guy who's got such poor crossing he's not that far off which is pleasing um assist per 90 minutes coates has the most baldwin saunders in there as well mcphee with the lowest it's just so obvious that, that what about chance creation is it the same kind of situation baldwin coates saunders lee and then niall mcphee again they're all just better from a creative standpoint on the right um we score more goals with baldwin in the team but look it's not too bad actually we're not scoring that many with ron coates because he's missing the bastards a lot of the time niall mcphee scoring a decent amount of goals with him in the team although he isn't actually one of the ones scoring that many of them he's got about the same kind of scoring record as ron coates interestingly saunders is actually better for that and he hits the target 65 percent of the time mcphee isn't hitting the target enough nor the, neither is lee and again it might be because they're shooting from further out because they're not getting in the positions enough because they're playing as a supporting for this is gonna be a really long video i do apologize shots on target per 90 minutes again coatsy saunders baldwin and just nothing less than half the number of shots in total but points per game Saunders, solid. No, McPhee, still over two points per game. Maybe it's just been a case of he's a really good player, but the things he does aren't actually showing up in his average rating because it's more simple things. And maybe with the tiniest little tweaks, we can get more out of McPhee for next season and see how things go. That's my theory, because I really don't think we need to be signing players in these roles right now, considering we've got absolutely stacks of talent. Maybe someone on the left, but we've got Rhys Stewart to come back as well. So I just don't think that's the case. We're really set there. As for strikers, I mean, really, we're not really comparing a great deal to be this one honestly this one um Tyrese Campbell's been just excellent just exactly what I wanted seven man of the match awards we can see less goals with him on the team he makes more interceptions he's won every single tackle he's put himself in for this year he's won completes less passes overall but look at the key passes higher wins more headers although not that many of them for a player who is six foot tall I'd expect to see a bit more of that but okay maybe we're not putting in that many crosses dribbles per game better cross completions better assists better he's creating chances uh we concede we actually score less goals with him in the team but Hegebo would have played in sort of a lower league matches against like worse oppositions hits the target more has more shots and we score more points with him in the team. Tyrese Campbell is excellent, but we're definitely going to need to strengthen it in our striking role. We need another striker at the club other than Orna Hegeberg because he's going to be gone in the summer. And hopefully if we can keep Tyrese Campbell, we're going to need a secondary striker uh, because he's going to get tired and we want someone that can come in and do a, a reasonable job up front. Worst case scenario, I can put Ron Coates up front, but I'd really rather have someone who can come in and do a job. Someone that's like a sort of 17-year-old maybe find another scottish guy i don't know we're basically just <laughs> we'll be we're just gonna be like braveheart with the amount of scottish players we're gonna have on this team and i'm all right with that in all honesty uh my people so that's kind of where we're at right now um let me see let's try and find uh word of the day um the word of the day is going to be relentless since i've got this giant can of it on my desk which i've been working my way through during this video so if you've got this far into the video write the word relentless in the comments of course let me know your thoughts on stuff and i'll be interested to see how this plays out into next season as we try to prepare for a year in the championship where obviously it's going to be about staying up i think we're capable of that uh with the right signings i think we can be lower mid table i don't think this is going to be one of these ones where we go back to back to back to back to back 
quite frankly, particularly not with the restrictions I'm placing on myself. But I'm all right with that, to be honest. I think we'll be fine with that. Let's just get a season where we can stabilize and really start building something for the future. Sort this tactic out and start really trying to jo join some, get some joined up thinking, bring through some young talent and really start to fire this squad into the next level. I want to build the foundations next year for what's going to lay the groundwork for the next five or six seasons of really bringing through an endless talent and it's going to be great anyway if you've enjoyed this episode and i really hope you have drop a like that would be tremendous if you're new to the channel subscribe and of course as always thank you so much for watching as always hold your gun happy bye. <laughs>